What's up guys, it's chapter 23, Managing the Great Depression and Forging the New Deal from 1929 to 1939. We'll look at Herbert Hoover and his response to the Great Depression, move on to Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and then we're going to look at how he dealt with the Great Depression, which becomes known as the New Deal, or sometimes known as the Alphabet Suit because of all the acronyms that you guys see here. Don't worry, you're not going to need to know all those acronyms, but you're going to need to know some of the major things that he did. We'll talk about critics of the New Deal, the second New Deal, and then impact of the New Deals to uh, different people in society. And finally, we'll wrap it up with the environment. So right at the top, Herbert Hoover, how did he respond to the Great Depression? He found that by hard work and in individual character in particular, people could get out of the Great Depression because according to Hoover, people's actions led to the Great Depression. So people's reaction is going to get the United States out of the Great Depression. He also felt that volunteer organizations should help out with the relief effort. However, Hoover did make two great mistakes. The first one is that he kept the United States on the gold standard. That meant that the value of the dollar was based on how much gold the United States had, and that was a problem. He also imposed high tariffs. And here's a particular example. The smooth Haley tariff of 1930 actually raised tariffs to 55%. That meant that countries who wanted to sell their goods here in the U.S. had to pay 55% of whatever the cost of the item was, which led to a decrease in world trade. In retaliation, European countries then imposed retaliatory tariff rates on U.S. goods sold overseas. So goods that were being sold in Europe also had a tariff, and those goods were really expensive, and people in Europe were not buying U.S.-made products which hinder global trade. So instead of making the depression better, Hoover's actions actually made it worse. And here's an example of that. So we have the smooth Haley tariff here in 1930. You notice it's right around 55%. So for every dollar that you were spending on an item, you had to pay 55% tax on it if that item was made overseas, in particular in Europe. And of course, you are not gonna buy a European product that costs is 55 cents more in taxes. If you could get a similar or that same product that was made in the U.S. for cheaper. What he did establish, Hoover that is, was the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, the, or the RFS, RFC, which provided federal loans to businesses. However, the loans, the money that were given out was too little, and that loans that were given out were too cautiously distributed, meaning some businesses got them, others didn't, so business did not boom, and unemployment continued to climb. Those people that did have jobs, they had to take wage cuts. So the Great Depression continued to become a major, major problem. People that started to live in pretty much items that were made out of anything became known Hoovervilles. These are shanty towns, and they covered themselves with Hoover blankets, which were basically newspapers. So these government programs were not aggressive enough to deal with the Great Depression, and Hoover felt that limited government was still the response to the Great Depression. Unfortunately, this is what we see. Here's an example of a Hoover bill in Seattle, a shantytown. And you notice people's homes are made out of scrap pieces of metals and any items that were left on the floor. That was not a proper way to live for Americans at this time. Hoover blankets, people covering themselves with blankets because they didn't have enough money to buy actual blankets. So all these are... All these problems are being blamed on Hoover, and to an extent, righteously so. If this wasn't enough, the way Ho Herbert Hoover deals with the Bonus Army pretty much dooms his faith. So the Bonus Army is World War I veterans who, from Seattle, started to march all the way to Washington, D.C., across country. They were able to build uh, more support, and people joined them. The bonus armies, again, are World War I veterans who, when they arrived to Washington, D.C., by the way, you see the uh, Washington Monument over here. Here is the Capitol. So the bonus army arrives in Washington, D.C., and they were promised a bonus for serving during World War I. However, that bonus was going to be distributed in 1945. What these veterans and their families couldn't wait 13 more years. The bonus army took place on the summer of 1932. So they had to wait 13 more years for their bonus to be given. But they missed the Great Depression, so they couldn't wait. So they set up a uh, camp in Washington, D.C., and they here they are lobbying Congress to pass the act to be enacted as soon as possible. 
as they are there, they set up camp again, kind of these Hoover Bills. This is in Anacostia, nearby Washington, D.C. They set camp and they start, you know, just uh, living their life there as best as they can for a couple of days. Now, what happens is that eventually Hoover asked the regular U.S. Army on July 28, 1932, to start removing the Bonus Army, veterans from World War One, and things turn violent. Some of these World War I veterans refused to leave the area of Washington, D.C. So some places, uh, sometimes some of the policemen started opening fire. They started uh, shooting gas on the people. Um, and so at the end of it, two people are killed. Apparently there's a baby that's also reported killed. Others are injured. And it, it creates a big chaos. And other people burn police forces, burn these shanty towers to get rid of the World War One veterans, the bonus army. So the way Hoover handled the situation was not ideal. Again, you see the Washington Monument on the background. Here is the aftermath of that. So the way he dealt with the bonus army pretty much stained Hoover's reputation. And his re-election in 1932 was doomed, which again, this happened only five months before the presidential election of 1932. So in 1932, Roosevelt, which you see everything here in green, he is a Democrat, he completely beats Herbert Hoover. This is a landslide victory for the Democrats and for FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. The, the, the uh, Democrats also take both houses in Congress, so they now control the, uh, the Senate, the House of Representatives, and the White House. Immediately, Roosevelt wants to get in touch with the people, so using the newly uh, item, the radio, he establishes what becomes known as these fire chats. These fire chats are simply announcements by the president appealing to the people. So people felt a connection to the president. The president gave them hope. They felt that the president was going to save their jobs, that they was going to save their homes. On the right hand side, you see a family meeting, gathering for a fireside chat. So people are able to hear the president's voice, something that had never been done before. And again, by the simple fact that they are listening to their president, they feel a direct connection with him already. The first 100 days of President Roosevelt are called the first 100 days. In these 100 days, he enacts 50 major bills that focus on solving four issues. First of all, banks, and they want to establish a bank reform. Second of all, agriculture, and the farmers are overproducing items, which causes the economy to go down. Unemployment for all those 25% of the population that is unemployed, relief, and then people who are losing their house as well, their housing crisis. No other president has done so much in his first 100 days than Franklin Daniel Roosevelt or FDR. So what did he, how did he deal with? This is again the New Deal, also becomes known as the Alphabet Tooth because of all the acronyms that we're going to be using. The first major issue that he tackles is the bank reform. The following day after his inauguration on March 5th, 18, 1933, FDR caused a bank holiday. In essence, he closed all the banks. Four days later, Congress passes the Emergency Banking Act, which allowed the banks to open only if they have enough money, enough funds to be able to provide people with their savings. Some people um, go, when the banks open, they go and they, re, they withdraw their, their savings. Other people, actually more people deposit more money on the banks. So we see here a little bit of the bank reform. The Glass-Steagall Act established the FDIC, the Federal Deposit Insurance, which ensured that up to 2,500 of your money will be saved and you could withdraw that money at any point. So people begin to feel more confidence in the bank system and they start to deposit more money in the banks. The second issue that he had to deal with, Roosevelt, was agriculture. So because farmers were overproducing, the Agriculture Adjustment Act came into place and they paid farmers to actually limit the crop production to increase prices. It also helped farmers to pay for their mortgages. So we see that Roosevelt is trying to help all sectors of the population, not just people that live in cities, but also farmers. The NRA, the National Recovery Administration, also set prices on farm goods and production quotas to limit the amount of pro pro production that farmers are producing. It also helped workers to organize, bargain collectively, and they got rid of what becomes known as yellow dog 
contracts. Yellow dog con contracts were contracts that people had to sign promising that they were not going to join a union. Well, this was a violation of the workers' rights, so the NRA got rid of that. It also restricted child labor. So we see again some advancements um, during the New Deal. The third issue Roosevelt had to deal with was unemployment relief. So we have about 13 million people who are unemployed and they need some form of help, some form of work. So first of all, the PWA, the Public Works Administration, set up construction programs. It employed thousands of people and $11 billion were used for public buildings, hospitals, courthouses, schools, bridges, roads, actors, musicians, and writers. And we'll talk about them a little bit more. But people started getting to work. The Civil Works Administration, the CWA, provided 4 million jobs to people repairing bridges, building highways, and construction public buildings as well. The CCC, which is one of the most successful programs of the New Deal, the Civilian Conservation Corps, provided 3 million young men. These are young men from about high school age to about college age, so right around from 16 to 24, provided them with employment in government camps, and they were in charge of reforestation, firefighting, and flood control. So, again, Roosevelt was trying to help all sectors of the economy. Now, the CCC was segregated. There were white CCC and there were black CCC. So we still do see social issues going on. This map kind of shows you every single dot here represents a CCC camp and it's spread all across the United States. And you also see the national parks here. So they established bridges and roads, yes, but also in these national parks, they established hiking trails as well. So the CCC provided for a lot of um, nature conservation and preservation. Here's an example, a picture of young men cutting down forests, um, and it could be used for many, many things. So young men are out there providing some form of help for the economy, and they're feeling useful. They are also having more self-esteem, and they're no longer relying as much on the government. The last major issue was the housing crisis. The Home Loaner Loan Corporation refinanced home mortgages, and it saved millions of people at home. So people who couldn't pay for their homes because the prices were too high, the Home Loaner the Home Owner Loan Corporation lower their prices. And then we also have the Federal Housing Administration, the FHA, which set interest rates and also help people with loans. The FHA still exists and people still get loans through the FHA to purchase a home. Chances are, if your parents bought a home, they probably have an FHA loan. Now, we do have critics of the New Deal. People on the right, people who are very conserv conservative, feel that Roosevelt is doing too much and he's over his powers as president. So they la launched an anti-New Deal campaign so that people could not support Roosevelt's campaigns and actions, but rather to regress it. And some of those major people were the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court declared that the AAA and the NRA were unconstitutional because those laws were established by the president, not by Congress, as though... Um, the Constitution gives power to Congress to establish laws, not the President. Critics on the left felt that FDR was not doing enough. Francis Thousands is one of these. He is an older individual and he wants old age pension. He wants $200 to be paid to people 60 years or over per month. This influences Social Security. And then Hugh Long, who was from Louisiana, he comes up with his program called the Share Our Wealth Society, where he felt that equal distribution of wealth should be shared by taxing the rich. And by that, poor people could have a little bit more money. Now, while these people were campaigning against Roosevelt, Roosevelt actually was astute and used some of their ideas in his second New Deal. So his first New Deal focused on economic recovery. His second New Deal now focused on social justice and a safety net, where government funds were used to help the people. The Wagner Act is an example of this. So since the NRA was considered unconstitutional and people couldn't technically join unions, the Wagner Act allowed workers to join unions. It also guaranteed them collective bargaining and it protected workers from employers. Collective bargaining means that a group of people come together and they bargain for better wages, better um, working conditions, and health pensions as well. So we see again Roosevelt helping the people. And then the Social Security Act of 1935 uh, gave old people pensions. It helped people who were unemployed get money. And it also provided money with for people with disabilities. So Roosevelt used the tactics that his opponents were using against him for the benefit of the public.